Hello everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, I'm recording in Reykjavik, Iceland as always, it's a sunny Saturday afternoon, I've uh, got a fun day ahead, going to see the rock band Pavement this evening, very excited about that, I've been playing loads of good games, um, I'm going to talk about some of them today, the featured game of the episode is going to be an indie game that came out last year, and I've had it on my Switch ever since, and it's a roguelike, it's a fast action 2D roguelike, and I never quite felt the mood for one of those, you know you need a mood for a game sometimes, this is one of those for me, it is Have a Nice Death, um, so I'm going to be talking about that one, it's an interesting game, it implements a lot of systems that I think people that like that kind of game would be into, um, some of those systems also confused the hell out of me, <laughs> so it's an it's a good one to talk about. I'm also going to talk about a few games that I've tried out, I've been kind of casting around between games for a main game lately, um, I've been playing Dead Space a Remake and really loving it, but you know, that's a horror game, it's kind of intense to play, I think you have to be in a certain kind of mood for that one, you have to be on your toes, uh, ready to jump out of your skin, basically. I'm not always in that mood. I like to play something a little bit low-key sometimes, you know. If you're playing after work and you've had a day, you just want to settle down and play something comfortable. So today I actually fired up Cyberpunk 2077 again. And I have to say, every time I play that game, because this this is a game that I absolutely loved. There is a episode about it in the back catalogue, a full episode. Um, I gave it a glowing review. I bought it speculatively when it was on a half-price sale, um, just to see what the fuss was about. This was about a year after it came out, something like that. Um, and I was blown away by it. I played 80 hours of that game. Um, I think it's among the best open world games that I've played. Um, which might sound like a strange thing to say, given the discourse around this game. But honestly, after credits, I often fall off a game when there isn't much more story for me to be had. And, um, and I've explored the world thoroughly and seen the systems. I will often get bored and tail off. But Cyberpunk 2077 is something different. I think it's one of the only open world games like that one, and I guess the Zelda games are like that for me too, where I come back to it and I can just lose hours. Um, Night City is such a cool environment that playing it today, I was awestruck all over again. Just the bustle, the ads, the noise, the traffic. There are things to do everywhere. There are shops everywhere. There is so much to do in that game, and the, the loop of playing it, is really, really effective when you're traveling around and you get like a, a call from a handler, depending on which neighborhood you're in, and he'll give you a new job. And the jobs tend to be pretty much alike in a lot of ways. You break into some kind of facility, you get into some combat, you find some information, you extract yourself, and then you get a call from the handler. Maybe they send you somewhere else. Maybe they just transfer you some cash. But you get a little video call on the screen in that AR way. It's just very satisfying. And there are all these uh, police jobs that you can do everywhere, which are basically gangs causing trouble in little corners of Night City. Um, and it's a good excuse to travel the city, to drive around, to climb tower blocks, to go into basements, to go under overpasses and to every corner of the city. And the city itself is such a joy that traveling around it is just an absolute pleasure. Um, it's one of the most advanced, interesting open worlds that I've seen. And they've melded it with gameplay in such a way that I can play it for hours. Um, and I'm never bored. I love Cyberpunk 2077. I'm really looking forward to the DLC later this year. It's one of my most anticipated games this year. So I think I'm an unlikely Cyberpunk 2077 fan. But I just wanted to shout it out because when I was between games and didn't know what to play, um, it had me covered, basically. I have also tried out some indie games this week. I tried out a demo of Grimoire Groves. Um, if you watched the Wholesome Direct, that was a very packed Direct with 80 games. Very few of them stuck in my mind, but this one did. I think it's partially down to the art style. It's very, very colourful. It has a day glow, uh, neon prismic fantasy setting. It's a top-down game, and it wasn't immediately clear from the trailer exactly what it's going to be. It looked like there was some combat. There was some very fast running movement with a good dash. Um, there seemed to be some Pikmin-type creatures, but something about it just stuck in my mind. Um, so there is a demo available for Windows, which is currently the worst place for me to play games. I play it on a partitioned Mac drive, so I get a little bit of lag and the performance is never good. But for a demo, it's enough to get a taste, so I went in. It's a super charming game. Um, I love the movement in this game. You really do sprint around this world. It's a pleasure to run around. Um, you have elemental spellcasting. You play a witch 
in a witch's forest. You have to go and do favors for mythical creatures. You have to gather seeds, which you can then plant and water. Um, you do fetch quests. You do uh, witch Wi-Fi, which is the network that you use to unlock skills in your skill tree. You forage for sticks and stones and fruits to unlock new abilities. Um, even just that little taste of it running very badly on my Mac um, has me interested. I think if you like games like The Wild at Heart um, and 2D Zelda to some degree, um, and if you like farming games, cozy games, there's a little bit of all of those in this mixture. Um, it is a demo, so some of the tutorialization was a little bit off. It's one of those demos that throws you in after the intro. So there's a little bit of clunky tutorialization because I guess they are shoehorning it into a later part of the game just so that the player can get up to speed. Um, but this is one that I'll watch with interest. That was Grimoire Groves. Um, no release date on it, but it's a it's an interesting one. It's one of the games that's stuck in my head from the Summer Games Fest this year. Um, I also got a code for a game called Koa and the Five Pirates of Mara. Um, this is a sequel of sorts or at least exists in the same universe as um, Summer in Mara. It's the same developers. I played a little bit of that game. It was a janky but charming farming and crafting game where you run around a 3D world. Quite basic looking, but good enough. They're also making Mika and the Witch's Mountain, which I know a lot of people are excited about. I've played the demo of that one too, and that's another janky but charming game. That one is a kind of Kiki's delivery service type of game where you're on a broomstick and you fly around doing little quests. This is another one of those kind of games. Um, this time it's a janky but charming 3D platformer. Um, but I have to say, I played an hour of this one, and I was not a fan at all of this one. Um, lots of bad decisions here, I think. When you first pick it up, you notice that the run speed in this one is incredibly slow. There is a run button, but the, the base speed is so slow that you will never use it. So you're basically holding down a button to run at a normal speed for the entire game. So one of my first thoughts of this one was why on earth didn't they realize at some point that the base run speed is useless and just make the the fast run the default speed and put a dash or something or a, you know something else, some other movement mechanic on that button um, to make it make sense. Um, the first quest was to collect 20 shells, uh, which is a good excuse, excuse to explore the, the base island of the game. Um, you don't have camera control in this one, so you're running around and the camera just does its thing which can work, like in a short hike, but often doesn't, doesn't really here, feels a little frustrating. Um, and there was no level design associated with this quest to find the 20 shells. You know, like in games like Super Lucky's Tale, um, every little detail, every little moment in the game seems curated and planned. So if you have to collect 20 shells in a game like Super Lucky's Tale, they are tucked away, they are hidden, they're behind a platforming challenge, or you have to dig under the ground to get into a little yard and pick them up. In this game, you just run around and pick them up. Um, there are more than 20 shells to collect, so you don't even have to um, exercise your gamer completionist instinct. Um, so that's taken away as well. So you're just meandering around this island, picking up shells that are in your path. Uh, you get 20 shells and that's it. That's your lot. It felt very unsatisfying to me. Um, after that, you go out to sea and... It's a really, really boring um, sea experience. You just move your little ship around to the next island. It doesn't feel good, doesn't look good, there's nothing to do. And then you get into, I guess, what is the meat of the game, which is these running sections. Um, it's a runner in that, that Crash Bandicoot sort of style, I guess, where you're running down a corridor at speed, picking things up as you go, avoiding obstacles. Um, entirely unremarkable and not fun. Like, there's no ingenuity or, or um, real charm and... Anything to really hold on to, if you know what I mean. It felt like I was playing a, a proof of concept of a game that has yet to be designed into to actually make it good. Um, so I played an hour of that one just to see if anything happened or if it developed or grew um, outside of those tutorials. Um, the best thing I can say about it is that it didn't crash. It's a stable build, um, but the, the look of it is very basic. All of the assets are very basic. The gameplay is very basic. Um, I did not like that one at all. I think this is among the worst games that I've played this year, actually. Um, so I won't be continuing that one. That's Koa and the Five Pirates of Mara. Um, another indie game that I picked up that I had better results with was Dave the Diver. I've talked about this one a little bit. It's a very charming 2D pixel art game uh, with two strands to it, a little bit like the game Moonlighter, if you remember that one, where by night you go into dungeons and kill monsters and collect their parts. And by day you go to your monster parts shop and you sell them and you have a shop minigame. This is the same structure, but in this one, uh, you go fishing, 
and you have to catch fish in a cool underwater 2D swimming game. Uh, you have an oxygen count, you, you dive deeper, it's a risk and reward system. The deeper that you go, the more danger you are in, and the more dangerous the fish get. Um, you use your harpoon to catch them, you have a melee attack, you can knife them, you collect as many fish as you can, and then you swim back up to the surface, and you go onto your boat, you talk to a, a guy who tells you about the restaurant, and then by night, you open the restaurant, there is a chef there who cooks the dishes, you have to prepare the menu based on what you caught, and then you have to serve customers. So it's like a speedy waiting game, table waiting. There's a, a tea pouring mini game. We get points for getting the right amount of tea. Um, if you get tips, if you take the dishes fast enough, really fun, fast and furious. Um, I really enjoyed Dave the Diver. What I've played of it so far, it is loaded with charm. Um, all of the gameplay is fun. Um, I love the music. I love the look of it. The characters are nicely written. Um, it has that Celeste-like burble voice that I really like to see. Um, really fun game. I'm going to carry on with Dave the Diver. This is the indie game that has sold um, a million copies, which is very impressive. Lots of personality and charm in that one. I'm definitely going to keep playing it. That's Dave the Diver. You might hear me do a full episode about that one down the line when I've gotten into it a little more. Um, the last game I'm going to talk about in this little roundup is The Last Worker. This is another 2022 game that I've had on my Switch for a while. Um, this is a first-person sci-fi game. Uh, you play as the last human worker in an automated sorting facility, like a giant Amazon warehouse. You drive a little floating forklift. Um, you follow your map. You get parcels from shelves. You take them to delivery points. Um, you have this flatbed truck, and there's a little game where you have to use this gravity glove to grab them and place them on your flatbed. Um, various things can be wrong with the package. It can be the wrong size or weight. It can be damaged. Um, but I found the UI of this one to be a little unclear. Um, as I was collecting my parcels, I couldn't quite tell um, how I was supposed to judge the size and weight. Like there's a very confusing uh, UI system where you use the D-pad to um, put stickers onto the parcel um, to identify that it is wrong in some way before you deliver it either to the trash, the recycling, or to the, uh, the mail chute for it to be sent out. Um, I couldn't quite get my head around how you're supposed to identify what is wrong with the parcel. Um, it's not fun to use the D-pad. Um, it seemed to work only about half of the time um, to get the right kind of sticker. And so while it is a game about doing a confusing, monotonous job in a, in a large bureaucracy, I'm not sure that the game experience is supposed to be uh, confusing and monotonous. It's supposed to be like a fun uh, activity even within that structure. And so I think it, this one fell flat for me a little bit. Um, I could see what they're going for. It seems like a narrative heavy game. It seems like it has that Portal 2 thing where uh, you might go into an area that you've never been into before um, and your character will remark on it. They'll be like, oh, something different is going on because they've been there for decades. They are the last worker, the last human worker. There are little droids flying all around you doing similar work to you. And as the last human worker... Um, it seems that the, stru the structure of this bureaucracy is perhaps starting to come apart. I'm guessing that's where the story will go. Um, but the gameplay experience was pretty unsatisfying uh, in this one, so I bounced on it pretty hard, unfortunately. Um, I would be interested to see where that story goes, but the gameplay isn't fun to me. I couldn't get my head around it. And with so many games to play, you know, if I give something an hour, I think an hour is a good chunk of time um, to test out an indie game to see if it has hooks that you're enjoying, to see if you want to continue with it. Um, so there's always this little assessment playtime with me where I decide if I'm going to go further with the game, you know what I mean? I did get a code for this one, so it's not like I have um, put money into it. And so with so many games to play um, and so little time, The Last Worker didn't make the cut for me. Um, I won't be playing that one again. I, I actually failed a shift because I couldn't tell if my parcels were damaged or not. Um, you get reset and you have to replay the shift in that case, and I just didn't want to do it. So... The Last Worker is a pass for me as well. So, you know, a couple games to try. Um, a few hits, a few misses. Grimoire Groves I will buy when it comes out. Dave the Diver I will continue playing. Uh, Koa and the Five Pirates Mara and The Last Worker. Uh, I won't be continuing with those two. So, you know, hits and misses. That's the way it is, right? But before we get into the featured review of Have a Nice Death, do allow me to mention this is a patron-supported show. Um, there have been a handful of new patrons lately, so thank you very much to Chris M, Artie and Reed, all of whom became patrons over the last month. Um, thanks very much, I really appreciate every patron. Uh, we are at 48 patrons now, and I've been thinking that when we get to 50, I will do something special for patrons, a patron-only episode of some kind, maybe a stream, maybe a tier maker of all the games that have been featured, 
maybe a special episode of one kind or another. So if you would like to become a patron yourself and help me reach that 50 patron goal, you can do so at patreon.com slash gaming in the wild for one, three or five dollars, pounds or euros a month. You get 10 bonus episodes for patrons only about music, travel, deep dives into games, other kinds of off topic podcasts. You get an invite to the Discord server for the show, which is a really cosy, patron-only corner of the internet where people are talking every day about what they're playing, um, sharing their stream links when they go live, sharing their Wordle scores and Coffee Golf scores, recommending new games, um, flagging up indie games that may have gone under the radar. It's a really good place to be. If you would like to come and join us in that community, it's patreon.com slash gaminginthewild, and I will put a link to that in the description. Um, You can also support the show by giving it a star rating on whatever platform you're listening on, Uh, sharing an episode with a friend, uh, retweeting the the new episode, announcement, all of that stuff is super, super helpful to help people find the show. So thank you very much to all my patrons. Thank you to everyone who tweets out about the show or tells a friend about it. And thank you to you, if that's something that you're interested in doing. And with all of that said, let's move on and talk about the featured game of this episode, Have a Nice Death. So Have a Nice Death is a game that came out last year in 2022. It is by Magic Design Studios, a French studio based out of Montpellier. Um, It's made up of former Ubisoft developers who've worked on things like Assassin's Creed and Rayman over the years, um, which I think goes some way to explaining the really tight, cool platforming in this one. Uh, It's published by Gearbox. Uh, Metacritic received it pretty well. It has 81 on PC, 78 on Switch. I think I first heard about this one in a Nintendo Indie Direct. I played it on Switch. Um, Performed okay. There are some hitches and frame drops on a Switch, um, but it was good enough for me, I would say. Um, This one got some good and bad reviews. Noisy Pixel gave it a 9.5 and said its systems are intensely addictive to provide a reason to return to the grind and clock in for overtime. Um, And they praised the finesse of the combat and the enemy designs. Um, Impulse Gamer gave it a 6 and said it takes the best bits of other roguelikes to create a slick adventure spoiled by an unrewarding difficulty curve. Um, I think there is some truth to both of those. The combat is definitely awesome, the progression perhaps less so. How Long to Beat has a massive range on this one. It says 7.5 hours for the main story, uh, 37.5 hours for main and sides, and 123 hours for completionists. I was very surprised to see that main story mark, because I've played for 9 hours, Uh, I mean, I think I'm in world five of eight, so I'm over halfway through the game, having played nine hours. I've beaten a bunch of story bosses, unlocked a lot of weapons, um, seen a few side quests through and so forth. But it's a roguelike, um, so it's, you know, it's one of those ones where you make a run, you get a build, um, and then you die and try again. Um, I'm not especially great at these games, I will admit that much, but the difficulty hasn't felt punishing. I felt like I'm trundling through it at what felt right to me. So seven and a half was surprising to me as the average time that people take to complete the story. Um, I guess I'm just slow on this one. Um, And the developers describe it by saying it's a 2D action roguelike where you play as an overworked death whose employees have run rampant, completely throwing off the balance of souls and his vacation plans. In order to restore order, you'll have to grab your trusty scythe and show your employees who's boss. And I have to say of this one that it's an enjoyable roguelike with slick and satisfying moment-to-moment gameplay. The combat and platforming are pleasingly fast-paced, and it's only slowed down by some muddled-seeming systems. Um, And I think that's about the the tone that this review is going to strike. I definitely love playing the game. The combat is so fun, Um, but there's a lot going on in here. You know, roguelikes do tend to be system-heavy and progression-based. Um, And whilst this game does nail the first part of that, I'm not sure it quite gets the second. Uh, But first things first, so it's a 2D action platforming roguelike, uh, side-on view, side-scroller. It has a stylized monochrome look to it, uh, black and white most of the time, although there are some splashes of colour here and there, um, which can get a touch samey, but it is also kind of striking. You know, it's it's quite a choice to go black and white. Um, You are playing Death. Uh, death is going through uh, some kind of burnout, is overworked. Um, and so there is a kind of a sad look to this world. It's the afterlife, you know, it's not going to be a theme park, I guess. Um, and as the overworked Grim Reaper, you are the CEO of this bureaucratic office of death. Um, as you are so overworked, as you'll see in the intro, um, it, the afterworld has become overrun with hostile souls who have not moved on as they should. Um, and your underlings, like your head of security, your head of catering, 
um, all of the different staff that help you run the underworld are all like little fiefs of their own fiefdoms and they've become unruly and they will be the bosses of this game. They have an eye on the top job. They've stopped taking your orders and you have to go and, uh, and put them back in their place. You have to get your house in order, reap all of the lost souls and fight off these unsatisfied employees. It's kind of a cool premise. Um, the dialogue itself sometimes feels a little um, off, I would say. Like as you're moving through this world, you talk to lots of NPCs, you have little pre-boss battle conversations where you as the boss will try and chastise them for the things that they are doing wrong and they will clap back at you. I guess these are supposed to be comedy interludes, but they didn't always make sense to me, honestly, just purely grammatically. Like I didn't always take the, the meaning from them. Um, I do wonder if some humour has been lost in translation here. They did feel a little Google translated, you could say. Um, but they're pretty quick and breezy, so they don't hold you back. Uh, as for the gameplay itself, you will go through short, sharp, maze-like levels. You start in your hub, which is the office, where you can power up, talk to your employees, uh, look at the stats from your last run, uh, choose the difficulty level, um, do things like that, spend your currency, upgrade. So you start in the hub, the CEO's office, um, and then you go into an elevator that takes you down to your first floor, um, you will use an elevator to move between floors as you clear them. They are roguelike, so they're always different, uh, but they are biomes, so they'll always be somewhat similar. Um, but they are short, sharp, maze-like levels uh, with lots of platforming and bouts of combat, basically. Uh, mini bosses now and then, a main boss after you've completed five levels in one biome. There are NPCs to talk to. There are things like a break room. If you're lucky, that will pop up. You can drink some coffee and recover your health. NPCs to talk to who will have little side quests and little comments about what's going on in the underworld, like a, a worker's strike or someone stealing their sandwiches in the break room. All of this like funny water cooler chat that you'll get as you travel through the underworld. Uh, there is a shop, there is a forge where you can power up, that sort of thing. Things that you probably expect if you're used to playing roguelikes. Um, there are a bunch of systems to play with. There are a couple of currencies to pick up. Um, there are two types of heal. You get three heal slots. You get a blue heal, which will give you back some of your health. You get a gold heal, uh, which will heal you in another way that I'll get into. Um, there, are, there is a base weapon that you get at the start of each run. It's your scythe, but there are a few variants of that. So you can get like a ranged scythe. You can get a short range scythe that's very quick, like daggers. Uh, you can get a big scythe that's slower. So you do get to vary up the, the base weapon from run to run. Um, there are, of course, boons, buffs, debuffs. Um, elemental things that you can get, like poison, burn, freeze, to apply different uh, elemental status effects to enemies. Um, this all varies from run to run, so it's always a little different in that, that fun roguelike way, and you may find yourself playing slightly differently. Not, not like Hades level, entirely new strategies based on the weapons you get, but it's at least a little bit of variation visually. Um, all the stuff that you expect in a roguelike is present and correct here. I'm not sure that it is entirely well implemented ultimately, but I will get to that in a bit. Um, first up, what's good about this game? The combat is the star of the show, um, and the combat is actually excellent. Um, it's fast, it's fluid, it's intuitive, and I took to it like a duck to water. It felt a little bit like the old instincts from Hollow Knight and Hades were coming back to me, uh, where you have to clear a room as fast as you can, um, not get hit, deal with mobs, um, categorize the threat level from different enemies and take them out in the right order. Um, you do so with several different attacks. Your build varies from run to run. You have your base scythe. You have uh, all of the different weapons you'll pick up along the way. You have a special that builds up over time that you can use now and then. Um, screen clearing to some degree. Um, there is jumping and dashing. So enemies will spawn in from time to time um, and you have to jump, dash, air juggle, ground pound. Um, and it feels quite acrobatic. I would say it's like Ori-style mobility in this game. You're very small on the screen, and you feel very light and agile. Uh, the jump feels great, which is not always a given. Um, I was watching a documentary last night in which um, there were various different platform games, like Mario, Rayman, uh, some Disney games, and that sort of thing. And getting a good jump in a game, just watching them on the screen, made me think how hard it is to get a good feeling jump with the right height, the right speed, the right fall speed, um, and control in the air. This one just absolutely nails it. It's a great jump. The movement feels brilliant. Uh, there is a dash, which gives you a really generous iframe window that feels right. Um, and I think that's not easy to do. So I really want to lavish some praise onto the control on this character. It feels wonderful to use it. You feel agile. Um, it's intuitive, instinctive, and precise. 
Uh, really, really good. Um, so you have your basic scythe, and then you have extra weapons that you can find in a run. You have three weapon slots. You can trade them out if you find new ones. You can power them up from time to time. Um, one of my favorites was bombs, which just like an area effect around you um, that explodes and stuns enemies. You have ranged attacks like arrows and shuriken stars. You have a big slow hammer. I know some people really like slow, powerful. Um, I guess with those weapons, you have to judge the timing of it more because once you are committed to the animation, you have to see it through. So I don't particularly like slow weapons, but they are there for people who like them. Um, you also have spells like lightning and fire. Uh, those are on a cooldown. I had a rocket launcher at one point for some reason, which was awesome. Um, these are sometimes called cloak weapons and sometimes called spells. Um, that's one of the many things that is confusing to me about uh, the systems of this game because they don't appear different on the screen particularly. Um, so a rocket launcher, I couldn't tell you if it was a cloak attack or a spell. Um, and this is where some of that confusion starts to creep in because when you get to a place where you have a choice of power-ups, you've got a rocket launcher, you can't tell if it's a cloak or a spell attack, and you can choose to power up your cloak or spell attacks starts to interfere with your progression, um, just the general confusion that lies over the systems of this game. But just to finish out the loop, so you will have field enemies that you'll find as you are exploring. These are just randoms wandering around. Um, you will also have wave battles where the doors are closed on a little arena area and you have to complete a few waves to get power-ups. Um, there are mini-bosses, which are like the assistants to the main boss, like their caretaker, their cleaner, their um, cultural attaché, all of these little mini-bosses. They're quite funny. They all have their little kind of story implication. Um, and then you get the big boss at the end of each world. Um, these are quite varied. Some of them are absolutely huge, screen-filling things. Some of them are absolutely tiny. Some of them have uh, very specific types of attack that you have to learn to avoid. Um, they're all in keeping with the theme of the level. So if you're in HR or security or accounting, maybe the accounting guy will pelt you with paper Maybe the security guy is just a big burly brute, etc. Um, they do blend together a little bit, I would say. Um, they are, because it's black and white, and because the, the bosses tend to be these black shadowy creatures that are a little amorphous at times, um, and the attack patterns are different, but not intensely different. Um, and I don't think any of them have different phases that I've encountered so far, or anything like that. Um, so I found myself switching off a little mentally and just blasting through them. Um, but the overall scenario is really fun. Like, I, I do enjoy that they are the heads of department, basically. I guess it's a little bit similar story-wise to Death's Door in that way, but rather than being like an underling crow, uh, you are the head honcho here of the underworld bureaucracy. And I do like that you'll meet your employees on your way through, just chilling, talking, chatting, uh, having diff different work problems, goofing off in the break room, uh, or trying to do their jobs hard at work, and they will have these little workplace comments, this office culture chat. Um, talking about what's being said in the afterlife slack. Like after you die to a boss, uh, you might get someone back in the hub saying, I hope that you didn't check slack because, um, you know, he's been saying some stuff about you and that kind of thing. So it's all it's all pretty fun. Um, and so far, so good, right? But I did run into some quite substantial problems with this game as well, as much fun as I was having. And it is a little bit of a laundry list and a little bit of a tangled critique that I have here. So but it is going somewhere, I promise. So do bear with me. It was really interesting to try and figure out the, the nuts and bolts of, of uh, the problems of Have a Nice Death. So let's do it. Let's try and get into it. Um, there are a lot of systems at play in this game, which I think is usually... Um, a good sign of longevity for a roguelike, you know, you, you want layered systems that grow over time because it's all about how can this game that is having you play pretty similar levels again and again, how can it change things up? Um, how is the meta progression? Do you get stronger? Can you blast through those early levels more quickly? Can you even skip them? Um, are there new weapons, new play styles that will occur to you after 10 or 20 or 30 hours of playing a roguelike? Um, and games like Hades are the gold standard, of course, and I would say something like Rogue Legacy 2 has an elegant take on how to balance out this repetitive gameplay 
with uh, novel elements and meta progression that makes it feel like you're always getting somewhere. But in this game, um, a lot of those systems are here, but they are not quite right somehow. The way that they click together um, and the, the way that they are named so that you can understand them quickly and easily, the way that they are explained at the start, um, and the internal logic of how they click together doesn't feel right. It feels really, really clunky and a little bit off, like the way that these systems interplay, the way that you learn to understand them, and how much of them you actually feel in your play. It's like they've studied a design document for how to make this kind of game, and taken a really good swing at it, but without fully having internalized what these systems mean or something like that. So um, I'm going to get into why. Um, I've been poring over and trying to pass exactly what feels wrong about Have a Nice Death because the combat rocks and it's really fun to play. Um, but as it is a roguelike, I think they do live and die to some degree, at least in terms of their longevity, on how good the systems are. Um, and at first there were just one or two things that caught my eye and confused me a little and I thought, that's no problem, I'll pick them up as I play. Uh, but they mounted up over time into being quite a stack of stuff. Um, which in the end turns into like a big negative segment in a review as I try and list them off. Um, so a few examples, um, for example, the level select screen. At the end of every level, or at the end of every sub-level in a biome, um, you will be given a couple of options. Um, this is standard in roguelikes. You can choose where you're going to go next. Um, they are named things like vault, or deposit, or cloak storage, or curse reroll department, um, etc., um, but those names don't seem to correspond to exactly what you think you're choosing. Um, even if you do, after after nine hours of play like me, you start to learn that um, if you go to a vault, you might get this certain types of currency that can be used. If you go to a cloak storage, you might get more cloak weapons, even if you're not fully sure what cloak weapons are. Like there's a chance you're going to get some kind of extra magic attack in there. Um, but they are named so strangely... Like, for example, there is a department called the Vitam department. Um, sounds like vitamin, kind of. Maybe it's something to do with health, right? Um, but your actual health or your heals are referred to as anima. And then there is like a, a separate kind of anima as well. Um, and so the, the naming convention of Vitam. Vitam is a word that is never used anywhere else in the game. Um, and anima is confusing as well because anima is next to mana, which is your magic. So you've got mana, anima, and vitam. Um, and this just starts to get a little creaky and confusing. This naming convention is way off. Um, so I wasn't sure exactly what I was picking most of the time, and that's a problem. I think in Hades, it was very, very clear. You beat a room, you have two doors, you go through one, you, you've got a chance of getting one thing, you go through another door, you might go to a shop. You can clearly tell what you're picking every time, and it really helps to build strategy in how you play the game. In this game, um, all the names are very confusing. You're never quite sure exactly what you're going for. Um, they're all very much of a muchness in the naming conventions. The signs don't look different. Um, and even when you do think you know what you're picking, like you might pick to fight a mini-boss, a Thanager, for example, um, and then you might not get a mini-boss in the next level anyway. So even when you pick, you're not guaranteed to get what you thought you were picking, which is so strange, such a strange decision. Um, I, last night I was playing and I selected to fight a mini boss. So I was good on health, good on heals. I thought, yep, I'll go for it. I'll try and get some more boons. Um, and I got an almost empty normal level. Um, an equipment store might seem like it's going to have a new weapon. Sometimes you go into a level that's full of currency and would seem to have been a vault. So none of that makes any sense to me. Um, and it does get confusing. You just have to end up switching off. So you've switched off that part of your brain that is trying to apply strategy to your run. Um, and that is a bit of a bummer. It's, it's, it's a bit bothersome um, to be going through a roguelike that has taken that away from you in some way. So it's a fail, basically, and, and a really interesting one. Um, it, it's a function that we see in many roguelikes, a simple one that allows you to execute strategy or build progression, and it just doesn't work here. Um, another confusing aspect, and there are many in all aspects of the game here, is the health system. There are two types of damage you can take. Normal damage that reduces your health, and then another kind of damage that actually depletes the capacity of your health bar temporarily by blacking some of it out. Um, there are also two kinds of heal, a blue heal that will just give you back some health and a gold heal that will then re, uh, reopen that closed off capacity in your health bar. So you've got two kinds of heals. But even in nine hours of play, I've never quite figured out when I get that 
that second kind of damage that takes down my health bar capacity. It seems like sometimes you're in a normal battle, your health bar goes down a little, um, and then you lose a little black part. And you're like, wait a second, um, what happened to make that occur? I would like to understand if there are attacks I should avoid that will deplete my health bar, because it's troublesome. You don't get that many of those gold heals. Um, but it doesn't seem to make sense when it happens. Sometimes you can be down to half of health bar capacity um, after a couple of battles and just not know how it happens. It's very strange. Like, I just do not understand. I have not internalised uh, why there are two types of damage or when they occur. Um, I think it would have been fine to just have a normal health bar. Um, I think they were perhaps trying to innovate here or to add an element of extra interest. Um, but I just don't get it. Um, I don't understand how it clicks with the gameplay. Um, I can't see how it's occurring, and so it just ends up being confusing. Um, and speaking of those two types of heals, um, I found that, you know, in Dark Souls, you fight your way between campfires, and then you can refill all your flasks, so you know there is something in your future uh, where you're going to have a chance, even if you're hanging on by a, th a slim thread in Elden Ring. If you get a, a sight of grace, you've made it. And so there is always this sense that um, it is possible in your future, even if you're having a rough time, that you will survive. Um, in this game, there is no reliable method for refilling heals um, in a run at all. So you get one health refill after defeating a, an end-of-world boss. Um, and other than that, it seems like there are pretty random moments when you might get another health. Uh, for example, you might find a break room, which you unlock through the meta progression, where you can drink a coffee and get a small percentage of your health bar refilled. Um, but that's just one room. Um, and I didn't find a reliable way to generate heals. They seem to come from random enemy drops. And I think refilling your heals is very important um, for progressing a run in a game like this. And it doesn't come on a natural, organised cadence. Um, sometimes you have too many heals and you haven't needed them. Sometimes you just don't get one for six levels and you die because you get hit sometimes. And it doesn't feel good. Like, there have been doomed runs in this game where you get hit a lot, um, you get your one health refill from beating a boss, you've got no heals, you just don't get any more heals, and so over the course of several levels, your health gets chipped down, then you die. And you had no chance of surviving, really, unless you played perfectly, uh, which is not an option, at least for me. Um, so I felt like throwing in the towel on some runs as a result, that's just another aspect of how this game feels wonky. Like, the heals just don't come on a good rhythm and that detracts from the, the, the constant feeling that you have a fighting chance. Um, there's more that I could go into. I mean, there are three weapon slots, uh, one of which is small. Um, and I never quite understood why it was small. Um, there are three types of attack, the basic weapon, the cloak attacks and spells. Some draw from your mana, which is your magic gauge, which refills on cooldown. Some don't. I don't know the difference between cloak and magic attack. Um, it's not signified in the icons when you pick up new weapons, or at least I haven't been able to untangle it if it is. Um, and that gets confusing, as I said, when you are trying to uh, plan your build and choose what to power up. There is also an intensely rare um, extra currency called Prismium. I've only had it once in my nine hours of play. I've just not figured out how to generate it. And you do need that to unlock more meta progression. Then you have curses, contracts, your anima, your mana, the naming conventions are very, very confusing. Um, contracts are offered at the start of each run by the gatekeeper who lets you into the levels. They seem to be risk versus reward, boon and curse type things, but um, it's not written down on the screen what you're getting. So maybe that's supposed to be that way. Maybe it's supposed to be random. Um, but I don't know what I'm getting or how long these curses last or what they really do. So it's just a bit in the dark. Um, and the, wo the word curses... Um, that confused me for so long. Um, there's lots of talk about curses. I didn't know quite what they were. I assume maybe they are the um, the detractors, like a debuff that you get from a contract. Turns out curses are actually the name that this game uses for your power-ups that you get between levels. Um, so confusing. Why would you call power-ups curses? It just doesn't scan. It's not logical. Um, there will be times when you can choose a level to power up your green or red curses. Um, I don't know the difference. So Everything that I'm talking about here, the list goes on and on, as you can tell. Um, I think there is something really off with how this game explains and expresses its systems and how they hang together that makes that whole very important element of the game 
Um, very, very confusing. Um, there is a, an info dump style tutorial at the start of the game, but it's not robust enough for the player to really internalize it. You know, you kind of just want to get to the gameplay. So you read it, you scan it, you click through it, um, and you assume that things will be apparent as a fairly experienced player of games um, and someone who has played Dead Cells, someone who has played Hades, someone who's played a fair few roguelikes, Rogue Legacy 2 for 20 hours. You know, you just think you're going to be able to get it, but you don't. And I think that that is a real ding on this game. Um, it's like a misunderstanding of how these systems work that is a, a shame for Have a Nice Death. And I think it is especially a shame because all of the ingredients are here for a good game. Um, it's very enjoyable to actually play. It's very enjoyable to actually fight in this game. Uh, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is a treat. The jump, the dash, the, the different weapons, the weapon variety, um, the enemy variety. Um, the movement is just spot on. Um, your character will do a little grab when you come near a ledge. So they'll pop themselves up. There are these little elevators that you push up and death just flies up them. Um, there is no fall damage, which is a great decision. Um, you can strike upwards or downwards and air juggle. Uh, you can stagger enemies to stun them um, and then take them out one by one. I really like how you hang in the air when you've hit an enemy so you can chain attacks in the air before falling. It becomes a big part of the strategy and it's very, very intuitive. All of the gameplay is pretty perfect in this game. Um, but that, that progression stuff just really puts a ding in it. So I feel like I'm using 40% of my brain um, and 60 is turned off just because of the confusion of the systems. Um, all of the extra stuff that would elevate it is just missing in action to some degree, or it's here, but in a really incorrect format. That said, I did about 10 runs on my first day. I've played it every day for the last week. Um, I, I will carry on. It is fun to just blast through a few levels, kind of mindlessly see how far you get. Um, I was thinking about playing it some mornings. I was like, oh, I can't wait to have a go on it. So it's very addictive. It's kind of relaxing. Um, but all of those lingering unanswered questions, I've even been into the codex to try and explain them to me and found that the codex, the codex text is um, also really unclear. So the game clearly knows that you may need further explanation, but the explanation is just not on point. Um, and I do think that roguelikes live or die on their progression over time. So I'm not sure how long this game will last with me if I will go further in it. I kind of want to complete a run at least, so I'll keep dipping into it when I want something quick. It is a good before bed Switch game. Um, and I will report back in the future if, if I realised that it was just me being dumb or having a mental block or something. Uh, but for now, that's what I had to say about Have a Nice Death. <laughs> So not the most glowing review, but it was an interesting game to play. It's funny to be playing a game that you are enjoying, but just to have so much critique for it. Uh, it's not something that happens a lot. Um, so it's an interesting one to play. Um, if you do like action roguelikes, it's certainly worth picking up on sale. I would say that much. It's not in incredibly expensive. I think it's £20 or something like that. Uh, I would like to say a thank you to the publisher for sending me a code. Um, and I'm sorry that it took me so long to get to the game. I think I've had this code in my back pocket for months and months and months, like eight months or something. Uh, but I did finally get to it. Um, and I do have more interesting games coming up. Uh, Venba is coming out this week for Game Pass. That's the food and family story and cooking game. I'm looking forward to that one. That's a nice short game. I'm also playing Viewfinder um, and enjoying that to some degree. Um, the voice acting is really doing my head in on that game, but I am going to try and finish it and talk about that one too. I know a lot of people are interested in that. So you can expect to hear about Venba and Viewfinder over the coming weeks. Um, if you have played either of those games, if you're looking forward to them, if there's another game that you would like to hear about, uh, please do get in touch with me. You can find me on social media at Gaming in the Wild. Um, I'm on Twitter, or X, as um, Elon Musk seems to want us to call it, uh, but I'm not going to be doing that. So I'm, <laughs> I am on Twitter, but I'm spending an increasing amount of time on Blue Sky and Instagram also. You can find the show in any of those places. There is a link in the show notes. You are also welcome to support the podcast, to help me fund it, to upgrade equipment, to make it sound better, to pay for the URL, all of the associated costs of running a show. Um, there's a link in the description or it's patreon.com slash gaming in the wild. Um, I'll be back next week with a new episode. So take care of yourselves and each other. Thanks for listening and bye-bye for now.